From Cross Culture Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is Crosswalk. Pastor Clay is away this week. We're glad you've joined us as we open the Bible and study God's Word. Now, here's this week's Crosswalk message. Amen. Yeah. Love it marks the day when sin it was erased. It's buried in the grave that he rose from. Amen and amen. Isn't God good, y'all? He's so good. Um, I, I find myself uh, thinking of warriors and knights and soldiers and stuff like that a lot. I, I've always loved it. I've always enjoyed it. My dad raised me to, to be a, a knight or a chivalrous man. He, he taught me about dragons, and he taught me about uh, the warriors in Scripture and, and all of that. And so I, I grew up playing with sticks and swords a lot. Um, lightsabers with Star Wars or, you know, just imagining all the different um, foes to vanquish. And singing a praise like that is so, so cool to me because Jesus really did come and he conquered death itself. And, and what's cooler than that? I mean, he, and he's coming back, and he's going to come back as a, as a conquering, victorious king. Um, that it's a day we look forward to. Um, but growing up overseas and playing with all the sticks and with my friends as, as much as we did, I always wanted to train in the sword with an actual martial art. That was something that I just yearned to do. If it was fencing, if it was, I didn't care what. I just wanted to learn how, how you're supposed to use a real sword. I was like, oh, that'd be so cool. Um, but there's no one to teach uh, us out there. And um, so I did some martial arts in college and really enjoyed that, but it was all hand-to-hand stuff. Um, and after graduating, there was a, a period of time where I wasn't really doing anything like that. Until I saw on my Facebook page this uh, friend of mine was training uh, with a sword with someone. And I was like, whoa, I'm pretty sure he's still in Jackson, Tennessee. I, so I messaged him immediately. I said, where is this place? I really want to go. And so he told me there was this dojo in town, and it had been there the whole time. And I was like, man, if only I'd known. I missed out on all these years of, of training. Uh, so I set up a time to go visit, and I went in, and— uh, I met the sensei there, and as he kind of walked us to the, to the edge of the mat, and you, you bow in respect to um, the, the time, to honor the time that you're going to be spending together. And so as we're about to walk on, he's like, we, we're a little zen here, but it's all good. And I was like, I don't know what he means by that, but okay. And so I, we bowed in. We, I just kind of found my spot all the way at the end for the, the, the child, the learner, the person who's new. And I went all the way to the side, and, and we, we sat down in the seiza, and we then everybody closed their eyes, and we just sat quietly for a little bit. And I was like, okay, I don't know what they're doing, but I know that when I close my eyes and bow, I pray. So <laughs> I'll just, you know, pray and thank God for this time, and, and I'll use this meditation to— um, thank the Lord and to, to ponder this time. And I was kind of surprised how, um, how relaxing that was and how much I needed that. And it felt like only 10 seconds before he was going, whoop, and we were standing up and starting to train. Um, and I valued that time. I came to really value the time where we sat and, and I would pray. I don't know what the other people were doing, but I knew that I would thank the Lord for a time to come to train, to leave the things uh, at the edge of the mat, to come to train and to focus and to be present in a place and to, to practice with people. Um, where we're going to be in the Word today, in Psalm 119, we're going to be focusing on meditation and what that looks like to be mindful of God and to be m- mindful of the Lord, to meditate on his word. What does that mean? What, is, what does meditation look like for a Christian? What does meditation look like? And we hear a lot of meditation talk uh, in the world today. It's becoming more and more needed even, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that too. So I'm very excited, and it's been something I've uh, been enjoying and taking part in for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to studying Psalm 119 with you. But let's pray before we start that. 
Father, I thank you that you are a God who loves. You are a God, you are the God who created the world. You breathed life into people. You have established the order of things. You have set things in their place. You have a plan, and it's good. You, you have laws, and you're just, and you love, and you're merciful, and you do good things. So as we bend our attention to your word, may the meditations of our hearts and the attention of our minds be pleasing to you today, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen. So let's make it a bit of an experiment this morning. Um, part of mindfulness and meditation is just bringing your attention back to the task at hand or to the focus that you have. So as we're studying or as I'm speaking, if you notice your mind start to wander, that's okay. Just be like, this is where I am. This is where we're studying. This is what we're learning about. And just bring it back. So you can do that with notes or you can do that without. But our attention together this morning is setting our minds on the things above to set our minds on what God is telling us to set our minds on. And in that practice, we'll get better and better at that. And I'm so excited to talk about what he does when we do set our minds on him in this way. So we're not going to go read all 174-ish verses of Psalm 119, but if you you look at meditation, it's like— these little pins that hold up this, um, this backdrop, that each time meditation occurs, it's focusing on a different aspect of God's law or what he's speaking. And as the psalmist continues, it has these focus points that um, he's going to talk about that will um, draw our attention to specific things as we go through, that everything else kind of hangs on from what he's talking about. So, the first meditation occurs in Psalm 119, verse 15. He says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Then in verse 23, he says, even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Verse 27, make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. In 48, he says, I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Verse 78, he says, let the insolent be put to shame, because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Then fast forward quite far, and in verse 148, he says, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. So the precepts, the statutes, the works, the statutes, the precepts, the law, the testimonies, and the promise of God. There's this descending and ascending, this, this going deeper into pondering the law of God, pondering what he has told us of him, what he has told us about life, what he has taught us to do, and then a coming back out to, to ponder on his promise. And so I, I, read, I read this, and in preparation for it, I was like, isn't that really cool that there are six of them, six concepts, precepts, statutes, works, law, testimony, promise. And there are seven days in the week, and God said the Sabbath rest, so uh, on Sunday I'll I'll think about God's precepts. Whenever I I have an open moment, used to I would just 
go to my phone and I would read an article or I'd scroll social media or I'd play a video game or something. And about a year ago, I started to trade that to reading books because I was also in school and I had a lot to read. So uh, I started trading that for books and really enjoyed doing that. And so every spare moment I've had recently, I've, I try to remember to be carrying a book with me or to read um, one of the many that I have on my reading list at the moment. But this week, I was like, well, I'll do something different. So I felt naked the first couple days, leaving books behind. Um, but I, the focus was, whenever I think about it, to draw my attention back to, okay, what are, what are the precepts of God on s- last Sunday? And then Monday, what are the statutes of God? What does that mean? Okay, what, are, what has God done? What are the works of God? What does his law say? And how do I love it? <laughs> what, are, what are his testimonies? What is my testimony? And what has is, what is he promised? And then Saturday was the, the Sabbath rest is for, in the Jewish tradition. And so that becomes a day that should be the day for a, a full day of, of meditation on, on God. It, it's a, I'm not going to work nor the people around me, uh, my, my family, the people who live or work in my household. Like, th- this should be a day that's reserved and holy for the Lord. And it was really cool to kind of go through that process and to end the meditation on the promises of God and then to go into the day of rest. It, it's a picture of, of, of life in its entirety, in a, in a given week. It was really cool. And so, so I, I did that, and I've been listening to some lectures to hear, okay, well, what are, what are other people saying about mindfulness and meditation and stuff like that? So um, I, I saw all this and thought, let's, let's experiment a little bit. And, and it was pretty fun. So I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what, we've, what I learned. But um, the purpose of mindfulness practice and why we hear that a lot these days We'll get back to the passage, but why we hear that so much these days is there's, there's a, it speaks to something about attention. And the psalmist in, in verse 15 says, I will, and fix my eyes on your ways. That's the beginning. That's the first point of meditation is I will fix my eyes on your ways. And we are a distracted people. There's so much going on. There's so much in our life. There's so much to think about that Fixing our eyes on any one given thing becomes incredibly difficult. And there are some ramifications to that. Uh, there's, there's a meme going around, actually, uh, that says, I saw this guy at Starbucks, and he, he was sitting there, and he didn't have a phone. He didn't have a tablet. He didn't have a computer. He was just drinking his coffee like a psychopath. Like, who does that, right? <laughs> like, who just sits there and drinks their coffee? Everybody has something that they're trying to, like, jam-pack life with because there's so much that we want to do and get done and it's crazy sometimes and yet it's so normal that for someone to do any one thing that's crazy that looks crazy uh i I love that meme it's it's kind of true you know we, we all laugh at that but fixing our eyes on god's way is um so incredibly important um so the concept of meditation and generally what people have practiced, if you come from an Eastern tradition or a lot of people are practicing whether or not you come from an Eastern tradition, is uh, to start with the breath. You close your eyes because it's, you're always looking around. So if you minimize the amount of stimulus, then you can pay attention to things better. That's the concept, right? So then you close your eyes and you just listen to the things around you. And if you do that for even a few seconds, you'll start to notice that there's a lot more going on around you than you realized. That you can hear the airplane flying up above. You can hear the birds outside. You can hear uh, a mouse in my pantry uh, (laughs) this morning, actually. You can hear, um, you can hear the breath of Caxton sleeping next to me. You can, you could hear, uh, people shifting, or uh, you just become aware of so much that you had drowned out because you're thinking or you're looking, right? So after you do that for a little bit, then you just focus on your breath, in and out, in and out. 
in and out. And it's, it's relaxing. It really is. It's kind of like when we start to go to sleep, if you pay attention to that. Your, bre- your belly rises, your belly goes down. I remember as a kid laying on my dad's chest and just trying to match my breath to him. He was sleeping because he has sleep apnea and he falls asleep like that all the time, even while playing cards or something like that. But so he had fallen asleep on the bed and I was a, I was a kid. And I was like, let's match my dad's breath. And it was so soothing. You know, it was, it was like we were, we were matched together and, and um, I don't know if I fell asleep or not, but I remember that moment. So you, you sit with that breath for a little bit and then you just pay attention to what you can feel touching your body, the, the seat or the chair or the ground or the air even, the wind in the trees. And then you go back up until you can open your eyes again and you've meditated. That's the concept. And I love how Scripture takes that, and like Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard it said this way. I tell you this. And he takes, he takes this concept and says, let's go even deeper than what you can hear, what you can feel in your breath, and what you can feel in the world around you. It's, it's not just about the thoughts and the emotions that, that come up and being like, okay, that's fine. I can acknowledge that, or I can accept whatever comes up. You know, it's not just that. It's um, I'm focused on this thing. But he says, focus on what's true. Focus on what I have told you is right. Focus on what I have done. Focus on me. And if you read the Psalms, a lot of them begin like, why are you cast down, O my soul? Or even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Or, or these people are, are attacking me, and, they're fle- and I have to flee, and, and, and I don't know where to turn, and, and I've, I'm at my wit's end, and, and the emotions, the feelings, the, the thoughts, they, they plague me. Even if I go into Sheol, you're there. And a lot of those, all of those psalms start there. And they start in a place of of darkness or difficulty, and they go to a place of healing and light and peace because of the truth of who God is and reflecting on what he's done and what he's promised he will do. It's not just a mindset of presence, but it's an alignment of the past, present, and future to say, God is God, and He is in control, and I put my trust in Him. That's good meditation. That's good meditation. Mindfulness and meditation, um, there are a lot of studies going on with it these days, and, and you can learn about it. It's really cool, so I really encourage you to go and learn some more about what happens, but, um, it increases awareness of both the internal feelings you have and the world around you, which can be helpful because sometimes we, we feel things inside or we think things, but we may not even be aware of it until you stop and you really start to pay attention. A lot of people turn to things to distract us We all do. We all do. I do this a lot. We turn to things to distract us from what's going on, really. And we can't deal with what's actually going on. And over time, that creates a lot of brokenness in our lives and in the lives around us. If we're not paying attention to what's actually going on, (laughs) Like, if you're not paying attention while you drive, you're probably going to crash, right? You, you really need to pay attention to what's going on in life, and sometimes that requires slowing down. Um, it increases a greater observation, uh, an appreciation for the complexity of things, because when we start to pause, we start to notice really, really small things, like the sounds, or if you sit down outside for just a few minutes— you'll start to notice all of the ants and the bugs, the, the, the minute world that exists that we just walk past every day, right? Like, it, it's so fascinating. 
And you can go to a, a third world country, you can go to a place like Oaxaca, or you can go uh, on vacation to the beach, or anywhere that's different than what we're accustomed to, right? And you start to notice all the different things. Uh, Katie and I went recently to Atlanta and went to this convention where there were just people in all these cool costumes and there's all these cool things going on. And I would get, I would get back to the hotel room and my head just hurt because I was just like paying attention to everything going on and everything seemed new and vibrant and important, right? And that happens in our thought life and in the way that we handle and address things that we think are obvious or that we know. If you think that you know something, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, let's get to something that I don't know. And if we don't dwell on that thing, then we'll miss the complexities that are still in it. And this, that's something I have so much learned from martial arts, is that doing the same first basic child white belt kata, the more you do it, the more you learn, the more complexity there is, and the more it unfolds. That's how we should treat the Word of God, the law of God, the promise, the works, the precepts, all the things that He has laid out for us. And, and we can get to a point where we might say, yeah, God, I, I know you. I know the gospel. I know what you've said, and I know these stories. I've grown up with them. Uh, a friend of mine he was telling me that he was in a Bible study recently, and they were talking about Jonah and how he gets swallowed by the fish and gets, like, thrown up by this fish on the beach and how he gets all the upset that when he shares the word, then the people actually accept and repent, and he gets mad at God. And, and the guy leading this Bible study says, isn't the Bible can be a little weird sometimes? Like, it, this, it's a little weird sometimes. And this lady just said, no, it's not. Just real quick, almost without thinking. Because these, we've grown up with these things, or we, we've grown accustomed to these stories, and we say, I, I know it. Psalm 119 is, is a person spending the largest chapter in the Bible reflecting on how it's so complex and God is so wonderful that He is worthy of our attention for our entire lives. There are even some health benefits. I don't, just want to share that with you. There are health benefits of paying attention that they have been doing a lot of research on what the origin of Alzheimer's or memory loss. And the more you pay attention to specific single things and practice this, it doesn't deteriorate. So you can keep uh, reflecting and critical thinking, which is the blending of multiple, multiple facets. It's it's not just, it's, it's the gray thing, the, the gray between the, the binary mindset. It's saying, okay, how can we critically think about the world and treat people as individuals who are unique, who have their own story, who uh, we need to listen to like they're someone who can teach us something, <laughs> or like God can teach us something. There's, it's, it's so, so cool. So, with that in mind, Let's go back, and we'll walk through each of these verses individually and reflect to meditate on each of these in turn. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. The precepts of God, think Proverbs, think the, the behavior, think the, the moral um, mindset, the, the way that we should think and the way that we should behave, the precepts, what God is told us we should do, that we should set our minds on things above, that we should set our mind not on the flesh but on the spirit, that to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace, that we should look not only to the, not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen, that we should focus and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that's Hebrews and Romans. That's First and Second Corinthians. That's, it, it's throughout the entire Bible. The precepts of the Lord. What has he said is the way we should behave and the way we should think. The statutes of the Lord, the Ten Commandments, 
You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not have any graven images. You shall keep the Sabbath day holy. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, witness, or covet. And that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You should teach these to your children. And the second is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. These things are the statutes, the commandments of God. The works of God. Verse 27. It's creation. What what has God created? Pay attention to the world around us. You step out and you look at the stars. You step out and look at the ants. And you step out and and you you see the beauty of, of a sunset. And it's not like, yeah, I've seen that. But it's like, wow, every time. It's so cool. It's reflecting on the providence of God. It's reflecting on the provision and the power of God. What he has done and what he, what he has done in the lives of people and in the lives of the, and the existence of the world. It's reflecting on his wondrous works. We can't look at them and say, that's not wonderful. When we reflect on his law, it, how I love your law, it's my meditation all the day in 97 it's his commandments in the, Levi- the Levitical law. In Joshua 1.8, God tells Joshua multiple times, be strong and courageous. Do not, keep the, do not keep the book of the law from your lips. Keep, meditate on it day and night. Right? Meditate on it day and night. It is the law of the Lord. And it's actually, you shall love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus 19. That's the law of the Lord. What does he asked us to do? What has he told us to do? And Jesus says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He came and he fulfilled the entirety of the law, and now becomes the, when we we start to reflect on the law, and then we look at Jesus and we say, he did all of that, and he made a way so that when we fix our eyes on him, that that he is that fulfillment of the law. And when we put our faith in the fact that he has fulfilled the law on our behalf and has become that Passover lamb, he has atoned for us. So we reflect on the law and we say, wow, I love that. I love that God has given this to us so that we can understand the, the weight of what Jesus has done. The testimonies, these are the covenantal statements like the Passover, the, the Feast of Booze, this, the, the celebration of the atonement, the um, celebration of uh, jubilee, of freedom from slavery, of releasing people from their bonds and their debts. It's a time for the Jews, each of these holidays, to reflect on the blending of what God has done and his law. It says, bind these together. And we have that new sacrament, the Lord's Supper. That, that is a testimony of what God has done in the lives of each and every believer. That's, that's the sacrament. That, that is saying he has atoned and we observe this together, coming together to um, share this testimony. That's why the Lord's Supper is for believers, those who have a testimony. Jesus says in John 3 that we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. But there are people who do not accept our testimony. And that's okay. We need to be persistent (laughs) and observe these things frequently that we not forget even what he has done in our own life. And lastly, in 148, that I may meditate on your promise. What's coming? What has God promised will happen? And if if you even take all these, we don't have time to to do that, but you look at just the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God blesses Abraham. He tells him to go, and uh, he asks him to do a lot of things that require a lot of faith. And that's before even the law was given, and yet he's credited as righteousness. 
And Isaac, God blesses Isaac. He says, I'm, I'm not only blessing you for your obedience, but because your father obeyed my statutes, commandments, and my precepts. You can find it. It's crazy. He, these concepts of precepts, statutes, works, and the law of God are, are so bound with the meditation of God in his word. This is a very Christian thing. But not only that, it's not just what he promised that we have seen fulfilled, but it's because he promised and fulfilled, we can look ahead at the promise that what is coming is a day when there will be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, when there will be unity and peace and prosperity, when we'll be in the very presence of God. And as a kid, I I thought, oh, heaven is like, there's all these like golden streets and houses, but no one ever lives in them because we all are just in the church service all the time. And that sounds kind of boring. But like, it's worshipful to live and reflect on these things of God. And so if, if in heaven we are constantly worshiping him and his presence is everywhere and we're in the presence of other believers and rejoicing in what he has made and how he's made all things new and and how he has brought to completion and perfection all things. That's worship, and that's awesome living in the very presence of the Lord God. What worshipful thing we should strain for. There's a one-to-one connection in this chapter between keeping the precepts, statutes, and laws of God through the meditation on him, his wisdom, his commands, and promises. Obedience, obedience flows from a gaze transfixed on the Father. Righteousness flows from faith transfixed on the Son. Obedience flows from a gaze transfixed on the Father, and righteousness flows from faith transfixed on the Son. He's constantly saying, Lord, I've been faithful. I meditate. Lord, I meditate. I've been faithful and obedient. Yet Psalm 119 even ends saying, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. How do we not forget the commandments of God? We meditate on the word of God. We, we cannot say, I believe you and I follow you, if we don't spend time reflecting and living what he has called us to do. But it is in the reflection in the live, it is the reflecting of what he has done and called us to do that enables us even to live those things. And when we meditate on the Word of God, when we take the time to pause and be still, there will be things that come up in our thoughts and in our feelings that we are very scared of, that we don't want to be true about ourselves, that we don't know where they come from, but the more that we think about them, the more that we pay attention to them, the more we realize We're not that different than the people who have accomplished terrible things. We're not that different from people who have lost all hope and who take their lives. We're not different from one another. The only thing that's different in such meditation, is saying, I will look beyond these feelings and these thoughts, and I will dwell, I will abide with my God. I will abide with Him. And the more that we see our brokenness and our fallenness, and the more that we see how difficult it is for us to live, 
the more compassion he gives us for the people around us. When we have a godly, mindful meditation, what does that do? It g- makes us mindful of the needs of others. Uh, there's this lady at BJ's who, she reminded me of my grandma. She was like four nine, probably. <laughs> so you're really short. I was going through BJ's and getting some coffee, and I stopped, and I saw her looking at the, the coffee shelf, and I've been practicing this like awareness all week, and um, so I, I pick up the coffee, and I start to walk away, and I just noticed her kind of like turn real quick and then like hesitate and then go back. And I was like, that's a little odd. So I stopped and she was looking at a shelf that was obviously too high for her to reach. So I asked her, ma'am, can I, can I help you with that? And she was like, oh yes, I thought that you walked off real fast. I thought you had somewhere to be. Generally, I have to wait for somebody and sometimes I wait even 10 minutes. And I was like, oh my goodness, like <laughs> uh, that's cool. I, I noticed something so subtle that I probably wouldn't have noticed before, but I was conscious of of this person next to me and was able to help them because I was made mindful of the needs of others. And that's not just like me trying that. It was was God creating an opportunity to love and bless somebody. It was really cool. Um, He makes us mindful of the needs of others. As I said, recognizing our own sin softens, softens your heart to God and to other people. You can't have, you can't look at things plainly, really, and have a hard heart. And that's, that's in Ezekiel. He says he will, he will break our hearts of stone and he will give us hearts of flesh. He says to Moses that he will circumcise our hearts, that he will, he will make us new. He will give us a new heart. He will give us a new spirit. And he does that when we fix our eyes on him and put our faith and our trust in him. It also prepares you to minister to people. Um, like the Starbucks meme, I went to a laundromat uh, yesterday to wash our comforter, and uh, there was this lady sitting on a bench, and she didn't have a phone or a magazine or a newspaper or anything. She was just sitting there watching everybody, and uh, I, I noticed her watching everybody and was like, wow, okay. You know, she, she didn't have anything, but I brought my Bible because I was still studying and preparing and praying for this, right? So I, I had this plan. I was going to come in while the laundry was going. I was going to get some more studying in. And uh, I sit down, and she turns to me immediately. She's like, what church do you go to? I was like, uh, cross-culture church. And how, how'd you know? She's like, well, you're wearing a t-shirt that has a verse on the back, and you're carrying your Bible. So I said, well, you know, those are pretty good reasons. Uh, so we got to talking, and, and I asked her, you know, where she go to church? She goes to a church called the Cup, um, because the Cup runneth over, and He has given us His His blood. And um, she's like, "Do you believe in the uh, the unfailing authority of Scripture?" I was like, "Heck yeah, I do! Let's do this! Let's talk!" And we started. I just asked her, "What has God done in her life?" And she talked about how He had provided for her when she didn't have money. He had saved two of her children from death's door, and that she was praying. Her son recently in the last couple weeks has been diagnosed with cancer. And she was praying that God would save his life because she'd, she's seen it happen. She knows that he can. And she's like, if he doesn't, he's good. But I really know he will. I was like, wow, what faith. She, and she just, then she asked me and I started to share my testimony. And she just ministered to me in a way that I really needed. And I didn't know I needed and I didn't end up spending any time reading, but that, that was a time that, because she was aware, she had made the time to pay attention to others and, and to talk to somebody. She ministered to me. And that is a holy calling that all of us in the church partake of. It's not just a minister thing, but we are all called to minister in this way. And when we reflect on the Lord, he begins to change our habits. Our habits begin to change because when we fix our eyes on him, everything else starts to fade away. What has stripped the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of peerless worth. It's a great song by Orta Rowan. Um, So he makes us more mindful of the needs of others. We recognize our own sin. It softens our heart unto God and others. He prepares us to minister to other people, and he changes 
our hearts and our habits so that we live faithfully and in a way that honors him. So when we meditate on the precepts, the statutes, the works of God, the love of his law, the promises and his testimonies, he really meets us there. Be still and know that I am God, he tells us in Psalm 46. So this isn't, <laughs> my, my prayer is this not be a, an informative message, but one that, and not even a message that like we, we meet together and God breaks us together today and we, we all gather at the altar and, and in that kind of worship, but one that we start with worship and that we all go and that he breaks us this week through this. My challenge to you is, is to meditate on the Word of God. And if you do that the way that I tried to adapt the Psalm 119 for fun, then go for it. Uh, if not, if you just want to maintain a quiet time or, or to spend time in prayer, find a way. Set your mind on things above. Set your intention and your gaze on Him who has saved you. with endurance the race set out for him. because he is calling us to a perfect holy place and he is calling us to love others in ways that we could not have ever even imagined we invite you to join us on a sunday morning at cross culture church we gather each week in a casual and contemporary atmosphere to celebrate the goodness of our god Cross-culture may be a little different from what you're thinking. Sure, we're a church, but instead of religion, we're about a relationship, a community of believers where Jesus is revealed in the lives of each person, real people who truly care, solid biblical teaching from Pastor Clay Stevens, and the most energetic, fun, and safe kids program around. Find out more at crossculture.church. I want to lead you to the cross. Cross Culture Church in North Raleigh, taking the cross to our culture and taking our culture to the cross.